William Samuel Bruce wrote to Raymond Stewart and said, perhaps the charge of new Calvinism was too generous. This is about, about me. It's definitely a valid charge given the mixture of ostensibly sound doctrine with worldly living. But in James White's case, the rot goes much further. Again, he promotes sound doctrine, but also, and so here's, here's where the rot is. Number one, vigorously defends a false view of Scripture and promotes corrupted Bible versions, often attempting to dazzle his hearers with an apparently deep knowledge of the issues and of the Greek in an attempt to belittle and silence his critics. So this would be uh, clearly either a King James onlyist or a TR onlyist. And so, knowing that the reformers were none of those things, <laughs> these are these people are more Calvinistic than Calvin, uh, who was none of those things. But uh, so, the first thing you say is it's a false view of Scripture. Now remember, I'm the guy that defends inerrancy. I'm the guy that defends the fact that we we continue to possess all the original readings and the manuscripts of the New Testament today. I have defended this in mosques and against atheists, I've debated Bart Ehrman, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I have a false view, vigorously defends a false view of Scripture. Well, I will vigorously defend the view of Scripture the vast majority of Reformed scholarship today holds over against these folks who do not hold the perspective that the vast majority of Reformed scholarship holds, that, that present a view of Scripture that the translators of the King James Version did not hold. They're the ones with the oddities when it comes to their view of Scripture. Um, but that's number one. Number two, platforms people like Michael Brown, who is a friend and defender of extreme charismatics and word of faith heretics. Well, boy, we've we gone over this one before. Once again, ignoring the reality that while Michael and I have done a tremendous number of things together, such as um, I still think one of the longest, most in-depth exegetical discussions of the Hebrew text of Isaiah 53, um, one of the most in-depth defenses of the doctrine of the Trinity against Unitarians, Michael Brown and I, um, a startlingly clear refutation, far clearer than anything I've ever heard from these guys, anything I've ever heard from these guys, of homosexuality in the church. Michael and I did that. Uh, the debate in Florida. Uh, which went so very, very well. Um, but despite all of that, I am also the person that Michael has debated more than anyone else other than Rabbi Shmuley Botiach. So I am the second most debated person by Michael Brown, where we are debating each other. So we have not, we have done programs on this program where we have disagreed, where we have dialogued about the things we disagree about. None of that has ever been just swept under the rug. It's been brought out there and debated on the basis of Scripture. And so if, you know, these folks, whether they would have the, the, the will to engage in that kind of meaningful interaction, do the homework that's necessary, rather than just simply repeating the same pious platitudes that in, was, was involved in the, the first point or not, I, I don't know. Um, but the reality is that when it comes to issues such as the doctrine of the Trinity, the Messiahship of Jesus, um, reliability of Scripture, especially knowledge of Hebrew and the, the, the Hebrew text, homosexuality, the entire field, um, who do we have that I would rather be doing those debates with than Michael? And he just drives you nuts because you don't like what he believes about the other things. Well, I don't either. That's why we debate him. That's why we debate those issues. But we do so as brothers, and you can't do that because if you're honest with yourself, you don't think he is. You don't think he is. There's the issue. Then number three, had to deal with this one, goes to mosques to, quote, debate, end quote, Muslims. They are formal, moderated debates. Why put quotes around it? Are you seriously suggesting they weren't debates? Bringing the gospel down to the level of being some way comparable to the satanic lies of Islam. 
Meanwhile, the Muslim debaters love him because he gives them ammunition for their claims the Bible is corrupted. Now, this was just a flat-out lie that I just simply had to expose, and I, I simply have to call for this gentleman to repent and repent sincerely for this kind of slanderous lie, because that's what it is. And, and again, the, the gentleman's name is William Samuel Bruce. William Samuel Bruce goes to mosques to debate Muslims bringing the gospel down to the level of being in some way comparable to the satanic lies of Islam. I wonder if all of those Calvinist missionaries that first brought the gospel to Muslims are not turning over in their graves at what has happened to the people they left back at home that have become this cold to missions work. What would you do, Samuel, if you had the opportunity to stand in a mosque and proclaim Jesus? Do you really think that's bringing the gospel down? Why? On what love? Give me some kind of meaningful argumentation from Scripture. Was Paul bringing the gospel down to the level of Jewish mythology to proclaim the gospel in synagogues? How about Roman mythology for proclaiming it in Roman cities, in, in, the, in the marketplaces? Is that what they were doing? Of course not. This is just pure, pure slander. It's just absurd. I do not understand what motivates someone's heart to look at opportunities. I would like to think that my Reformed brethren would rejoice that we have actually had the opportunity of walking into places like that. And we got to go in those places, not because those people think that we're compromisers. There's not a one of those people out there that think I'm a compromiser. You name me a single, a single Muslim apologist that I've debated that thinks that I compromised in anything whatsoever in my encountering of that, with them in, a, in, in, the, uh, in the mosque. Not a one of them thinks that. Not a one of them thinks that. And you take this, this, the, this the second part because you hold to this, this indefensible view of textual critical theory, this indefensible view of history, and say, see, they love him because he gives them ammunition for their claims the Bible is corrupted. Not when they're debating me. Not when they're debating me. Maybe you haven't watched some of the debates about, about allegations of biblical corruption, but you're not even close to a semblance of reality in dealing with those debates. Look at the debates I've done with Adnan Rashid on the subject. Look at the debates I've done with Yusuf Ismail in South Africa on that subject at, at, at Northwest University, Pachas Room. You couldn't do that, and you know that. And yet you sit behind your computer screen and take shots as a reformed, a truly reformed person. Stunning. Shame on you. Just shame on you. You just, wow. White, like so many other new Calvinists, probably been a Calvinist longer than he has, is unafraid to resort to dishonesty and mockery in support of his position. Well, no examples were given, of course. Um, that's just the, the way that slander works, is just throw it out there. Uh, but this is the kind of stuff that you're, that you're dealing with when you encounter the crusty Calvinists. The, 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 the Calvinism that is traditional, the Calvinism that very often does not result in a... There is, there is a way of being bold in evangelism that will communicate that your heart is passionate for the salvation of the people to whom you are reaching out. And then there is a way of being bold in evangelism that says the exact opposite of that. That says, I'm doing this to prove something to God, and I really don't care about you. That's not what we've ever wanted to communicate to the Muslim people, or to anybody else that matter. Or to anyone else for that matter. But there is, sadly, an element in Reformed theology that can lead to that kind of crusty hardness that truly it brings disrepute to the gospel. Um, so there you go. You, you go out there, you seek to uh, bring the gospel to uh, the Muslim people, and that's what you get from the folks back home. <laughs> is is something uh, like that. There you go. Well, that's one of the reasons I, I've, I said it before, I'll say it again. I, I don't 
care about the Calvinist club. I don't care if people want to say, well, he's not Reformed because he doesn't dress like me and he doesn't sing the songs I sing or he doesn't tie his shoes the way I do or whatever else. Um, Reformed theology is biblical theology. I'm not moving from that. I'm defending that. But I'm going to tell you, it's far too easy for me to point to example after example after example of people who get their theology straight and lose their heart in the process. Not interested in it. Don't want it. There's a good example.